Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, now let's try and shake the physio world a bit today if we can. I was asked to talk about expanding our understanding of entrapment neuropathies and neural pathology to you today. And as you're all familiar with, entrapment neuropathies are caused by pressure on peripheral nerves as they travel through narrow anatomical spaces. And common entrapment neuropathies are certainly carpal tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, and cervical or lumbar radiculopathies. But they are also a bit more controversial entrapment neuropathies, such as Morton's neuroma, piriformis syndrome, or tarsal tunnel syndrome. Now, when I went to school, it was pretty clear that it is quite simple to diagnose patients with entrapment neuropathies. And indeed, if you follow the diagnostic guidelines today for both, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome and radiculopathies, the guidelines say that patients should have a dermatomal or a territorial pattern of symptoms. They should have positive electrodiagnostic tests if these are available, meaning that the nerve conduction velocity is slowed. And when we do a bedside neurological examination, it should be positive, meaning that patients have difficulties failing light touch, muscle strength, and reflexes, which is the standard bedside neurological examination. Now, in physiotherapy, and that is noted in the guidelines, we also use neurodynamic tests um, to diagnose uh, or to, make, to see whether nerve involvement is more likely. Now, today I would like to discuss with you three buts. First, what if a patient has clear symptoms, for example, of a carpal tunnel syndrome, he has tingling, he shakes his hand, and it gets better. But when I do the neurological bedside tests, like light touch, muscle strength, it is completely normal. Does that then mean he doesn't have an entrapment neuropathy? The second but, what if a neurodynamic test is negative in a patient where I believe he has an entrapment neuropathy? Does that then exclude such a problem? Most importantly, what happens if patients have symptoms that do not follow the anatomical, dermatomal, or territorial pattern? But what if they have widespread symptoms? Does that then mean they don't have an entrapment neuropathy? And today I would like to discuss these with you, and I will also have a slight excursion uh, into the double crush syndrome, which has been very topical. And I would like to discuss consequences for diagnosis and management um, with you today. Now first, what if neurological examination is normal in patients with entrapment neuropathy? And for that I refer to light touch, reflexes, muscle strength, which we commonly do. And if you have access to neurophysiology, that would also count to a neurological examination. Now, in order to answer this question, I would like to take you back to the actual anatomy of a nerve trunk. And this is an electron microscopy image that I took of a sciatic nerve of a rat. And you can see that we have a lot of different nerve fibers within the peripheral nerve trunk. We have the thick myelinated big axons, and then uh, we have small unmyelinated axons, for example, C fibers, which are responsible for warm uh, sensations or nociceptions. And we have the thin myelinated nerve fibers, which, mediated, which mediate cold and nociception. Now, when we do our standard bedside neurological examination, we exclusively test this thick myelinated fiber population. Even the standard electrodiagnostic tests do not test anything else than the thick myelinated fiber. Now of note, the thick myelinated fiber only make up 20% of a nerve trunk. So that basically means that we might be neglecting 80% of a nerve trunk when relying on these tests. Now how does it come that we are relying purely on these large fiber tests in clinics? And I believe that comes historically because in animal models that have been used to mimic nerve-related problems, um, what they have done is that they um, ligate the nerve or chronically constrict the nerve quite heavily, which is an acute and a rather severe injury. Now, if they do that, the large fiber are indeed the first ones to degenerate. However, our patients certainly do not have an acute injury most of the time, and they also do not have a very severe nerve compression, but usually a rather mild one. And it therefore remains unknown whether what animal models so far have shown actually applies to patients with entrapment neuropathy. Now, in order to address this problem, we refined an animal model that mimics mild nerve compression. And we did that by me operating a, a tube, a silicon tube, around the sciatic nerve of rats. 
Now, these rats are young at the time of the tube placement, meaning that the tube itself does not constrict the nerve, but it is just snugly sitting around that nerve. Now, the animals then uh, are kept happy over three months, and they feed nicely, so they start growing, and as they grow, the nerve starts to slowly compress within that tube. So we have a model of a chronically developing, very mild entrapment neuropathy, which mimics what we see in our patients. And I would like to show you what we find in this model, what happens pathophysiologically. Now, first of all, let's look at the demyelination of those larger fibers or the myelinated fibers. This is a longitudinal section through a sciatic nerve. The rat on the left side is a normal nerve that has not been compressed. And the green stain is the myelin, stained with myelin basic protein. And you can see a really nice myelin sheath. On the right side is the nerve that has been compressed over three months very lightly. And you can see that there is almost complete demyelination. So it's quite, quite a significant demyelination, really. And when we quantify that, this is statistically significant and it is dose dependent. So the tighter the tube is, so the more the compression, the more demyelination. And the less we compress, the less demyelination. Now, if we look at this demyelination, we thought, well, the large fibers most certainly must degenerate because you have such an amazing amount of demyelination. However, when we looked at it histologically, that is what we found. In fact, when you look at it, we did not find anything at all because the fibers on the left side, here stained with protein gene products, staining all the fibers within a nerve, they had exactly visually the same amount of fibers at the compressed site. So that was a bit puzzling, and that really was contradicting to what other previous models have seen. So we wanted to look a bit more closely. And what we did is that we stained specifically for the small fiber population with calcitonin gene-related peptide. And what we identified were these varicose dotted-looking fibers. And these varicose fibers are an indication of a degeneration. Now, it was even more puzzling because that is really not what we thought would happen in a compression, that the small fibers start to degenerate. So we looked at the level of the dorsal root ganglia to kind of see whether we made a mistake. And when we looked there, we stained with activating transcription factor 3, which is upregulated if, 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 if an axon is damaged. And you can see that the upregulation of this factor was predominantly in the small fiber population, further supporting that there is indeed something happening to these small fibers in an entrapment neuropathy. Now, when we quantified that, we also confirmed that it was the small fiber population that was lost at the level of the dorsal root ganglion. Now, that poses the question whether we are indeed neglecting the small fibers in our patients. I would like to point out, though, that this was an animal model, and obviously it's difficult to say whether that translates to what we see in our patients. So what we did is we actually did that study, and um, we used carpal tunnel syndrome as a model system to look at it. Now, obviously, I can't cut out the median nerve in these patients, but what I can do is I can take a skin biopsy in the median nerve territory. And as you all know, a substantial proportion of our sensory fibers uh, start and end in the skin. So therefore, the skin biopsy is a great window that allows me to look into the nervous system. And when we did that, we first looked at the large axons. So I quantified the number of, uh, the number of Meissner corpuscles. Meissner corpuscles are the receptors of the large myelinated A-beta fibers, so the touch receptors. And as you can see, we did not find a significant loss of these large fiber receptors. Similarly, when we quantified the number of myelinated dermal fibers, we could not find a significant loss of the myelinated fiber population in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome, further suggesting that the large axons remain spared. However, when we looked at the small fibers, it was a really different story. And I would like to show you here, this is a skin biopsy with the dermal layer at the bottom and the epidermal layer on the top. And we know that those fibers in red that penetrate into the epidermal layer are exclusively small fibers because the large fibers never penetrate into the epidermal layer. So we can basically count how many nerve fibers does a patient have in the epidermal layer of the skin and that gives us an idea about potential small fiber degeneration.